meeting will now come to order. Please rise for a moment of quiet reflection and the Pledge of Allegiance led by Councilmember Binsbacher. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Carlett? Here. Vice Mayor Finn? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Hunt? Here. Councilmember Patena? Here. Councilmember Binsbacher? Here. Councilmember Edwards? Here. And Councilmember <clears throat> Leone? Here. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the Peoria City Council special study session of April 10th, 2018. Uh, we have one item on our study session agenda for this evening, and that is the fiscal year 2019 budget study session. And with that, I will turn it over to City Manager Jeff Tyne. Great. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Council. I appreciate this. And so for uh, those in the audience not aware, this is the second of our budget study sessions, um, a very long, extensive budget sessions. So in our last uh, discussion points, we primarily focused on the operational aspects of the fiscal year 2019 budget, and I did want to thank uh, our staff for all their efforts in developing this, and also to Katie Gregory, who just, um, I, I think, does an outstanding job in really um, identifying all of the key elements of our operations and how our budget relates to that, and so I, I really appreciate Katie and Barry for all their work, uh, specifically <laughs> in doing the presentation on that. We wanted to do some housekeeping real quick today. Um, and then I wanted to just take a moment in a second to talk a bit about how we're going to structure ourselves in the next year to really address the council priorities uh, that you've identified. Um, and from there, we're going to focus the vast majority of our time going through the capital improvement program. And in a second, I will pass it over to Andy Granger, uh, who can go through that specific piece. And then lastly, should we have that chance, or uh, we do have time scheduled for a next meeting, but if not, we will go through the budget adoption schedule to make sure that you're very comfortable with that. So with that, just a couple of quick follow-up items that we wanted you to be aware of here. Not all of them are listed here, so, uh, but we, will, we absolutely are taking copious notes on all of your comments. Uh, but a couple of them that we wanted to identify, there was a good question regarding, uh, I believe from uh, Vice Mayor Finn, regarding the exit interview process, and it was one of the performance metrics in our spotlight on the Human Resources Department. Uh, one quick adjustment, the fiscal year 2017, I don't know how you knew this, but fiscal year 2017 data, we did, um, that actually there was uh, one individual that had a different rating, but it was 98% that, that was that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there, there was a question, I thought, uh, in regard to that performance metric, is, um, and again, just as a reminder, this is for those that voluntarily do an exit interview, would they recommend the city of Peoria as an employer? We received very good comments in that area. That was 48% of the outgoing employees that completed that exit interview. So um, to answer that question, uh, council member. Um, in addition to that, there was a very good discussion regarding our special events. Uh, a couple items that actually came back from that. Uh, one of them, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Hunt had talked specifically about the, um, the Shakespeare in the Park event that we undertook this year and an interest in incorporating that. And so, of course, we will look and see how we can uh, incorporate that within the arts program and the special events program. And we will obviously get back to you on that piece. Uh, also, additional questions from the mayor and Councilmember Binsbacher with regard to reviewing our special events and having an independent analysis, both um, the opportunity for what we would call a signature event, something that would be a high profile event that would be a draw, um, and looking at what would be the right draw for that, that taps into our community and to our interests and it really identifies, uh, that creates an identity for us. And, and um, in addition to that, a good conversation about looking carefully at our very strong special events program and making sure what is it how are we achieving it? And what are different management uh, opportunities that we have within that specific area? Uh, we talked about different amounts that that would might be. I would anticipate if we're going to look more comprehensively at a special events, it's going to be more than the identified 30,000 that we would have just to take a look at that signature event. We will look closely at our budget, look at kind of a sense of what those types of projects are. We have a our materials management can look closely at such studies across the country, get a sense of what that cost is, and we'll look to try to incorporate that in the 
tentative budget that is brought forward to you. So more to come on that piece. Uh, another question with regard to Merrick did have a question regarding the economic development and just did some. Uh, the use of data and the analytics of that data. Um, we're eager to look more into that and report back to you. So as we get back to you and the economic development uh, does give an update to this, uh, to this body, we will make sure to kind of talk through not only about what information that we have and can get and how we can share that, but also maybe what are some other opportunities that we can do for analysis on that. And so more to come on that piece as well. Wanted to uh, just take a moment uh, thank you. If you, yeah, next slide's fine. Uh, talk about the organization itself. So as we continue to evolve, and as you've identified your council priorities, both in November and then uh, again validated in January, it was important that we as an organization also continue to evolve. So we have looked very closely to make sure how is it that we can be in sync with our community as well. And so that means taking a good fresh look during this budget year at our organizational structure. And we have done just that. Uh, over the last few months, we've worked very closely with our executive team and our department directors to look at how we are configured and align that with what are the needs and interests that we've all identified. Some of those things that came out, we just wanted to go through real quickly. One of those is recognizing uh, the public works and utilities, which currently is one department. It is a very large department with very different kinds of functions that are in place. Our sense is that we would benefit if we were to have those as two distinct departments. Right now, in many ways, they have their own unique culture, not because of the, the people personality piece, as much as just the technical requirements of those specific areas. And as a result of that, it, it seems to us to make sense of that. So we did have a charge within that area to look at a way if we can break that department out while being cost neutral, we believe we have found a way to do that and we would look to incorporate that. So in the tentative budget that we bring forward to you, we would look to have that as a di two distinct departments. Uh, in addition, we are looking, the management uh, and budget department and the finance department, we looked closely, had a lot of conversations. And any given time, you might see in, um, within communities, sometimes the budget department is separate, sometimes it's combined. Oftentimes, that relates to the city manager and their ability to have a close relationship with their budget director and having an understanding of that very complex issue. We're very fortunate we have a lot of presence of budget directors in the <laughs> executive leadership role. As a result of that, we believe that we would be able to merge that department. Um, if that's okay with Katie, so, okay, so. Uh, in addition to that, we wanted to talk about um, a, a couple other areas. If you mind, sorry. This, um, we currently have what is termed the Community Services Department. As you're all aware, uh, John Sefton, who does just an outstanding job in that oversight of that uh, huge department that manages um, so many important divisions that we have at the city. Uh, what we're sensing is looking closely at that as well as a lot of the attention that we've talked about in really focusing more on different aspects of our neighborhoods and the community and the heightened awareness to our human services. Our sense is that we would like to create two different departments. The first, just to be clear, parks, recreation, and library would continue to be uh, overseen by Mr. Sefton. That would include such areas as all of our neighborhood and community park and its maintenance, library services, the sports complex operations, sports, aquatics, and all of our special interest classes, the recreation center, right away in landscape maintenance, and from the police department, the park rangers would all be within that area. So again, still continues to be a very significant size department. But we think is much more in line with uh, the experiences that we're trying to provide for all Peoria families. Uh, but in addition to that, we are now looking at a new department. And that new department would include where we currently have within the planning and community development area, the human and neighborhood services function. Many of you know uh, Karen Imig that works as the manager in the, over that specific function. But it also would include from the police department our code compliance, so our code enforcement officers would be within this specific area. We'd also look at our before and after school programs and summer, uh, some other summer programs, the adaptive use programs, little learners, 
different types of programs that we really see are in many ways a social service to our families. So if you think about it, the before and after school program is somewhat of a daycare program. We see it aligning with many of the social services we have, so we believe it would be housed in this department, as well as the community center here just down the street would be included within this area. Uh, and then lastly, special events in arts and culture. The idea here is that as the city continues to grow, we see ourselves growing in two ways, both of course expanding, but also maturing. The idea is that let's make sure that we really activate all of the different areas of the city on a more localized basis. And that includes within our arts <coughs> programs, our special events programs, how we coordinate with businesses in the area and the neighborhoods and the not-for-profits. The idea is to house that into one department. So uh, again, just so you're aware, the idea here is that we will be cost neutral in this specific area. We've already identified some other positions that we would merge, that would assist with the support of this new department. It would be that we would have a, a director position that would be available at the spot that is not currently slotted at this point in time. So wanted to make sure you were aware of these changes. Again, no change that we anticipate in the authorized strength for any of these adjustments, uh, but we do believe that this is better aligning with what we've heard as the council priorities. So any questions real quick before I go on on that piece? Council, Council Member Hunt? I don't think I was clear, Jeff. Um, sure. You'll be hiring a new director for the, the Community Services Department or how mm -hmm. you said it was neutral? Right, I apologize for uh, not being clear no, on this. Just, I just so, uh, for example, we're uh, looking to merge one department, create some staffing opportunities. The, um, on our executive floor, we are looking at a vacancy position that we would be able to apply towards this specific area. The result of this is that we believe we could create a director position, a new position called Community Services Department Director from existing positions that we have right now that are currently vacant. Okay, I assume that this person has these qualifications or I, I'm sure you probably already have someone in mind. So uh, this person, it wouldn't just be someone that got booted out of their department and then we're slotting them in here. You know, Mayor Pro Tem. squeezed Tem, out a, or whatever. It's a great question, Mayor Pro Tem. There is not a, a person that is slated for this. What we believe is that we want to have a director there that really will be transformative in this area, that really will be able to take the, the priorities we have of really uh, creating a new type of employee engagement, uh, uh, or excuse me, of citizen engagement, and a way to activate our neighborhoods in a new way. And we're going to be looking for a unique individual so are you to do that. you taking applications for that then? Mm -hmm. There will be. We anticipate An if, process. as we go forward with this, um, we are anticipating moving uh, so that this would be in place by July 1st. Okay. I trust you. Thank you. Thank you for, for letting us know about this. I think it's really important for us to know, and, and it looks like all of these changes um, go towards uh, the goal of getting closer to our neighborhoods and you know, making um, uh, more progress in, in some of the areas that are our biggest priorities. So I'm really happy to see it. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I have one more. Yes. So as far as the, D the DCMs, mm -hmm. who is going to be over these, or will it be two different ones of you, or? Right. I we anticipate right now the way that we would be structured um, is that we would have Eric Strunk that would oversee the community services department as well as the parks, recreation, and library department um, okay. with Andy Granger focusing on both development services and police and fire and then as well Katie Gregory that would be overseeing much of the administration management services related functions. Um, I, I do want to bring out, I think it's probably important to know, uh, these are incredibly talented individuals that over time I would like them to rotate and have experiences in all of these areas, but for this transition we believe that would be that way, configured that way. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so with that, I would like to pass this over to Mr. Granger uh, to now go through the bulk of our presentation on the Capital Improvement Program. So. Thanks, Jeff. Mayor and Council, we are excited to present tonight the proposed fiscal year 19 10-year capital budget. As we've done in the past, we've organized the CIP presentation to start with a CIP funding overview that I will do. And then after that, I'm going to turn it over to Adina Lund, our engineering uh, director, to 
talk about the completed projects over the last fiscal year, uh, talk about projects under construction, projects in design, then talk about some new projects that are entering into the capital program this year, and then lastly, the community works program. And then again, uh, any remaining questions that, or comments that you have at the end, please feel free to ask. But uh, as we're going through the presentation, as we've done in the past to, <laughs> as, we, have we, as we've done in the past to, um, feel free to ask any questions as we go through each project. Thank you. Um, as far as CIP funding sources go, uh, this pie chart indicates the, uh, all of the funding sources that comprise our proposed capital program, 10-year capital program. As you can see, the, the main sources are, are revenue bonds, uh, geo bonds, our operating funds, that's our water, wastewater revenues, as well as our HERF funds, our highway user revenue funds. Um, impact fees make up 13% of the capital program, and transportation sales tax makes up 13% of the program. This uh, bar chart shows um, our history of, the, of our total 10-year capital funding program for the last 10, well, it shows the last 12 years here. As you can see, and it's been an indicator over the last um, seven years, we've increased our uh, capital program consistently. Um, this is indicative, indicative of our property valuations going up, our assessed property valuations going up, as well as increases in our sales tax uh, revenues over the last seven years. And it's also an indicator of uh, the economy growing over the last seven years also. Um, the $729 million budget uh, is an increase uh, over last year's 10-year um, program, which was $659 million. And then as, as um, during the budget presentation yesterday, it was indicated that the fiscal year 19 capital program specifically is $277 million, which is an increase of, um, from the previous year, which was $212 million. That increase primarily is carryovers as well as three construction projects that will start this year that are significant um, uh, capital projects in, in our capital program. That's the Pyramid Peak treatment uh, expansion, our community park number three, and the Happy Valley Parkway widening project. Those three projects are significant projects that make up the difference in, that, in, the, in our capital program for this next year. Our 10-year balanced. Um, Andy, if I might interrupt you, just for people who, who might have been looking at other cities' budgets or something, I, I would just like to reiterate that our 10-year CIP is a fully funded program, has funding sources that match every single expense for 10 years back. It's not a wish list. It's not something we hope we can dream up, you know, how to pay for things as they come forward. It is fully funded. I just wanted to say that for anyone who is watching from home. Thank you, and, I, and I'd like to state that we're unique in the Valley and that we do have a 10-year uh, fully funded capital program based on projected revenues. Uh, most municipalities have a five-year program. I think it's, it's a, uh, a testament to us in, in planning for the future growth of the city to have a 10-year program um, to help plan for that future growth. I agree. Thank you. And as always, the recommended capital program reflects our best efforts to address council goals and priorities to make Peoria the most livable city we can and, and to address those livability initiatives that we talked about at the workshop in last November. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Adina. Thank you very much. Are you I'm gonna give her the tie? <laughs> <laughs> That's the break. We'll save the tie for next year. All right. <laughs> I am very happy to be here tonight, Mayor and Council. Thank you for the introduction, Jeff and Andy. I want to start off by thanking my department. They do a great job. I have a lot of project managers and additional support staff that make sure we get all these projects completed on time and within budget. And they're very important to our successful program. We're going to go through the projects that we completed this past fiscal year. I know you're aware of many of them, but I just want to give a brief overview. The Pinnacle Peak Public Safety Building, which we opened in October of 2017, was a 17,000 square foot expansion for the police department. It will be housing our expanded patrol services for the northern part of the city. The total cost of that project was $11.4 million. The P83 and bridge and freeway signs, this is the final phase of P83. 
This was part of our phase two improvements. It included the refreshing of the bridge over the Skunk Creek and the fabrication and installation of the two new P83 monument signs. The bridge was completed in August and the signs were just recently installed. Those costs were 788,000 for the bridge and 390,000 for the signs. But like I said, that was part of our phase two portion that we had talked about last year. The Veterans Memorial, which is housed at Rio Vista, that included a wonderful dedication ceremony on Veterans Day <laughs> that we were all so proud of. It has a restored Huey helicopter that you can't miss when you drive into Rio Vista. And we have flags honoring each branch of the military, a wall so that you can inscribe a relative's name, shade canopies, and additional seating. And we are so proud because every time we walk by, we see a lot of residents out there enjoying the facility and taking pictures. That cost was $870,000. The New River Trailhead at Fletcher Heights, which is located on Deer Valley Road, just west of 75th Avenue. This was our first trailhead on the New River Trail system, which is 22 miles of trail along the New River. So this is an opportunity for people that don't live adjacent to the facility to be able to enjoy it. That was completed in August of 2017 for a cost of $1.1 million. The Palo Verde Ruins Interpretive Plan, which is located in our Terramar subdivision. That project, we constructed a walkable loop trail and an added interpretive signage to explain the history of the site. That site is on the National Register of Historic Places. A large portion of that funding went to extending a drainage channel across the site. It was not for the sidewalk and the signage. That was $774,000 and was completed earlier this year. The Varney Park Improvement Project it was also started as a drainage project. We have significant flooding that was happening on 81st Avenue in the Varney area, and we were flooding out some properties. So we needed to redirect that water into a basin, and we took that opportunity to replace the irrigation system and add sports lighting for further places for people to warm up for sports activities. Mm -hmm. That was completed in November of last year at a cost of 432000 99th Avenue reconstruction from Butler to Olive. This project, we raised the profile of the roadway to eliminate the flooding that happened to occur quite often. We also were able to install a sidewalk from Olive to the Park West Shopping Center, so people are able to walk to that center now. That was completed of August of 2017 at a cost of 1.1 million. 89th Avenue Half Street Improvements. This project was is on 89th Avenue from Olive running south to Golden Lane. We completed the west half improvements on the street, and at the same time, we were able to repave the east half of the roadway. That project also included undergrounding utilities along Olive Avenue, and that was funded through SRP Aesthetics Funding. Unfortunately, APS does not have the same program, but whenever we can take advantage of it in the SRP area, we do. So that project was 1.1 million, but SRP funding was 420,000 of that. The Peoria Homes Alley improvements, this was a new program that we had not done before. In the Peoria Homes subdivision, we repaved five alleys, installing ribbon curb and giving the whole area a new look. That was completed in November of 17 at a total of $490,000. The Monroe Street improvements, those go from 85th Avenue to 83rd Avenue right in front of our beautiful city hall. We installed a raised landscape median, decorative street lighting, and brought in brick paver elements from the downtown. Also, we had a drainage problem that existed at 85th and Monroe that you might be aware of, and we were able to install some new catch basins and storm drains to alleviate that issue. That project was completed in December of 17 at a cost of $500,000. That was just some of the projects we did because we would have been here all night talking about all the smaller projects. <laughs> we are going to move into projects that are under construction. And those are projects that are currently under construction or we will be starting this fiscal year. The Beardsley Road Channel Project, which is located on Beardsley Road from Lake Pleasant to 111th Avenue, is piping the existing channel. You can see a great photo that was taken by the contractor with the drone. It really shows how large this pipe is. There's a little speck, a guy with the yellow vest. The pipe is almost as tall as he is. 
We're then installing a 10-foot detached sidewalk in desert landscaping with shade trees. Construction is ongoing and we're expecting completion the fall of this year. We are coordinating with adjacent projects including a flood control project and some development projects in the area. The total budget for this is $3.9 million. Next we have the Section 12 Local Drainage Improvements. Section 12 is an area of custom homes in the northern part of the city. It's bounded by Hatfield Road to the north, Pinnacle Peak to the south, 67th Avenue on the east, and New River on the west. We have experienced flooding many times over the years, and we finally have a project to address this. This is considered interim improvements. There's a regional project that will follow in a few years. This project will be installing basins, channels, and reconstructing roadways to get the water where it's supposed to be going, which is to the river. We are finalizing the design and the land acquisition, and construction will be completed by spring of 19. The total, the total project budget is $6 million. This includes the purchase of the land. Amoresco Energy Efficient Projects. If you've been to the Sunrise Library or you've been over to a Development Services Building, you have seen the new parking canopies going up. Besides provided shaded parking, we are also providing solar on those canopies. Additionally, we are doing LED lighting retrofits in many of our facilities such as the Sunrise Library and Rio Vista. These are also being done at fire stations throughout the city. The retrofits for the lighting should be complete in May and the solar installations will follow this summer. The total cost for this is $6 million. We will be repaying those bonds with the energy savings from the projects. Which makes it cost neutral. Yes, it just takes time. Yes. New River Trailhead at Westbrook Village. This will be our second trailhead along that New River 22 mile path. We just started construction earlier this month and this is located on 83rd Avenue just north of Union Hills. The construction will be complete later this summer at a cost of $940,000. You want me to go back? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm. I'm just confused. If it's going to be complete in 2018, what's the budget for fiscal year 19 for 250? Is it just a timing issue on it? Is that what I'm The seeing? money that we already spent was the, the 940000 is what we total for the project. The 250000 will be the carryover for this summer. So the 700000 will be spent by the time we get to July 1st. Okay, I got it. Okay, thanks. Northern Community Park. We recently came to you with an update on the park. This is our park that is located at the Loop 303 and Lake Pleasant Parkway and includes lighted fields, playgrounds, and a fishing lake very similar to our other community parks. It includes an IJ with Flood Control District and the, we will be coming to you in June with the GMP, the construction contract, and then this summer we'll start the archeological investigation which will roll straight into construction. We expect the opening to take place in spring of 2020. The total cost for that Phase of the park is $41.4 million. 103rd Avenue improvements from Northern to Olive. Two lanes in each direction with a raised landscape median. We will also be installing right iron fence on the west side of the roadway. This project is also installing a brand new water line as the aging infrastructure needs to be updated. Construction is expected to begin, begin this summer as today it is supposed to be advertised for low bid. Estimated completion will be a year later. The total cost is $5.6 million. Oh, Carlo? <coughs> yeah, do you have a, <coughs> excuse me, do we have a time frame on that Olive to Northern? On 103rd from Olive to Northern? 103rd Avenue. Yes, we are advertising it for bid today. So we will open the bids in May. We'll come to council in June for approval of the construction contract, and then it will start later this summer. And that includes the sidewalk, landscaping, yes. and the wrought iron fence. Correct. But you're gonna keep one side open until one side is finished and close the other side and finish that off. We will be working closely with our contractor when they are on board, and we will have a public meeting to explain any types of restrictions for the adjacent community but we need to keep the road open to get people in and out of their neighborhoods. Okay, thank you. 
the 75th Avenue inter intersection improvements at Cactus Road and Peoria Avenue. Those were started last summer, and I know it seems that they've been taking a long time. We've been working on all of the underground utility work. This includes some undergrounding of some of the communications. It includes SRP irrigation work. It includes installing new water lines and installing a, a regional storm drain at Cactus Intersection. We are starting to move to the rest of the project, which is the actual widening and the installation of the new signals. We will end up with better capacity by installing dual left turn lanes and dedicated right turns. We also are installing medians for access control to increase the safety at those intersections. The construction was always promised to be done this summer and we are still on track. The total for these projects is $18.4 million of which 13.2 is from the federal government. We actually obtained approval for that funding in November of 2011. So it takes quite a long time to get through the federal process but it is well worth it. 83rd Avenue bus shelters. We are installing bus shelters along 83rd Avenue from Butler to Bell Road. This is on our new route that started in October of 17. The shelters include solar powered lighting. We are additionally pursuing 500,000 in federal grant money so that we can finish all of the shelters and improve shelters and shade along Peoria, Thunderbird and 67th routes as well. The installation of the shelters is ongoing and the targeted completion is in the spring of 2019. Total funding is $980,000 and all of that is regional funding. None of it is city dollars. So I just heard you mention shade. Yes. But I'm not seeing it. Just with what's in the picture. We have areas that we are looking at increasing shade components, either man-made shade or adding some trees to existing shelters and new shelters as we go. Is it budgeted? It is part of the budget. Okay. So that's why right. we can only do some of the shelters and we need additional funding. So some of the money is going towards the shade. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, Carlo? Yeah. yeah, do we have those bus, those bus shelters all over Peoria, just certain areas? This is just starting on 83rd Avenue. We have different ones on Peoria and Thunderbird, but we're looking to change out the ones on Peoria to the same shelters and Thunderbird we're still discussing. Now who pays to put those in? It's all with regional funding. Because I like to see those in Peoria for the shade and for the people where they can sit down and, and wait for the bus. We agree. We definitely need to have shade at our stops to make them well-traveled. Okay, thank you. Deer Valley Road and 87th Avenue traffic signal. This is installing a brand new signal. We included an IJ with the county as the north leg of the road is within the county's jurisdiction. We completed the final design in January, and at that time we ordered the poles. Surprisingly, it now takes six months to get traffic signal poles. So we are still on track to complete it right before school starts. The total for this project is 630,000, of which approximately 100,000 is coming from the county. Happy Valley Parkway widening project. This project is from Lake Pleasant Parkway west to the Loop 303. The original project was in the city limits and just extended from Lake Pleasant to the Agua Fria River. We pursued a partnership with the county to extend it to the Loop 303. They are contributing a substantial amount of dollars and in exchange we will be annexing the road in its entirety when we are done. So this will have three lanes in each direction. It includes building a brand new bridge structure over the Agua Fria. We have worked hard on the bridge aesthetics and on all of those streetlight com columns there is a place for public art. We'll be working with the school system this fall and with the community to see what kind of ideas we can generate for those pieces of artwork. This also includes some enhanced bicycle and pedestrian facilities as there's a large biking community that uses this road on a regular basis. The final thing we are doing is installing signalized access to the Lake Pleasant Pavilion Shopping Center, which we know is the Target Shopping Center. This will provide for safe left-hand turning movements in and out of the center if you are headed to the Loop 303 or northern parts of Estancia. This also contributes to safe travels between the two shopping centers, the one on the north side as well. We are almost done with design and construction is anticipated in fall of this year and will take approximately a year. Total cost is $19.4 million with the county share being $2.6 million.
And Dana, I'd, I'd just like to highlight what, what Adina stated as far as the, the county partnership that we've had on this project. And, and there's another project she's gonna highlight, the Pinnacle Peak Road project, where we have a similar um, agreement with them to partner on those unimproved roads adjacent to existing communities that would really never be improved unless we had this partnership with them. They're in the county jurisdiction. We went to the county and the engineering department negotiated uh, agreements on both of these projects to, to fund those street improvements so that now we've got an urbanized street when we're completed with these two projects uh, that is consistent with the rest of our city. So where are you talking about? Pinnacle Peak and what? From 91st Avenue to 95th Avenue, we've got an agreement with them oh. also, and we'll, we'll highlight that project in, in a moment. Oh, okay. This bridge is beautiful. It's really Thank a you. work of art. I wish those people walking there had something good to look at as they looked over the edge. Um, but are we gonna have our Arts Commission uh, work with your department uh, on how, that, how the aesthetics can, can end up? We are working with our Arts Department right now and it is, we are seeing it as a public involvement to come up with the ideas for the mosaics, and then we'll be bringing those forward. It's beautiful. It's really Thank great. You. And, and the intent is to have artwork on, it may not be on every column that on both sides, but um, it may be every other one where it's on the inside so that the, the traveling um, vehicles can see it, and then the next one it'll be for the pedestrians oh, to, bicycle. and bicycle, bicyclists to see it on, on the next column as far as the artwork's concerned. Really nice, and the way it's set up for the bicyclists and pedestrians, um, I mean, they can't help but feel safe there for sure. I believe it's 12 feet it's wide. It's 12 feet wide because we wanted to be able yeah. to accommodate a sweeper because there's nothing worse than riding your bike when there is debris on the roadway. We have to get a new sweeper just <laughs> for this. <laughs> no, a standard sweeper will fit in the 12 oh, foot wide. Oh, I see. Well, thought of everything. Good. <laughs> we try. <laughs> The next project is the Lake Pleasant Parkway sidewalk on the east side. We did a similar project on the west side a few years ago and we often see people traversing this area. This is constructing the missing sidewalk gaps that exist between Williams Road and Joe Max on Lake Pleasant. In areas where we have street light conflicts and we have to move the street lights, we're replacing them with LED lighting. The final design will be complete in May. Construction will begin in late summer through winter of 18. Total cost for this project is $2.1 million. Pavement rehabilitation and preservation. We had a study session about this recently where Public Works came and Stuart and Janet spoke in depth about this program. So I'm just going to highlight a few items. This involves all of our surface treatments for roadways, including arterials, collectors, and local neighborhoods. The budget for fiscal year 19 is $7 million, and we have highlighted the arterials and collectors. There are other additional neighborhoods that are in the program that you can talk directly with Public Works about. The total for the 10-year program is $71.4 million. The Thunderbird Road corridor improvements. This project extends from the Loop 101 to approximately 81st Avenue. This is a capacity improvement project. If you travel the corridor, you know that there's a lot of vehicles traveling on Thunderbird. It's starting to be comparable to Bell Road. We are increasing the left turn storage capacity at the Loop 101 for the left-hand turning movement. And also, if you are traveling eastbound on Thunderbird, the left-hand turning movement to 83rd Avenue. We are also restriping the southbound lane on 83rd to be a right-hand turn lane if you're headed towards the Loop 101. The final improvement we are making is extending the third through lane east of 83rd Avenue. Right now it is a very short lane and people get in there and then they try mm -hmm. to merge and it's not a very safe situation and not many people are using it. So if we extend it, we can get more people through the intersection. Construction is expected to start as soon as school is out and continue through the fall. We do have a public meeting scheduled for Monday so that we can talk to the businesses as they will be impacted by this project. We anticipate working with a job order contractor and being able to do most of the work at night to limit the impacts. With that being said, we have a companion water line project that is starting next week underneath the Loop 101. So there will be traffic impacts for that. But that is because that section of water line has had historic leaking problems where we have unanticipated shutdowns which cause a greater problem than a planned shutdown. So there will be lane restrictions in place starting in April, probably continuing through the fall because one project will roll into the next. The total price for the Thunderbird Road improvements is $2 million. The next two projects 
talk about the water enhancements for the northern part of the city. These are both developer-led projects. The first one is the Lone Mountain Parkway 36-inch water line, which extends from the existing water line at Lone Mountain in the 303 to Lake Pleasant Parkway. It's installing a 36-inch water line. It connects Vistancia's system, which is primarily a well system, to the rest of the city, which gets a lot of water from the CAP. This is, helps to make both of our systems a robust system because it provides different, moving water throughout the city is always a good thing for the system. It's part of the joint development agreement. Construction will begin at the end of the summer, will take approximately a year to complete. The total cost is 10.6 million, of which the development community is paying $6.7 million. That is just an estimate as we don't have final cost yet. So this project seems like it's been going on for a really long time. Am I imagining that? No, it has been <laughs> in the works for a long time. And part of the issue has there is BLM property. And BLM property is the same issues that we've run into with North Community Park, where it involves federal process, archaeological investigation, and just seems to slow the process down a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> Thanks. The companion project is the Westland Road Reservoir and Booster Station. This is also part of the joint development agreement, and it brings new water facilities to the north. It's providing 2.5 million gallons of storage for future development. I had utilities translate to what that meant, which is about 10,000 new homes. Construction will be starting in April of 2018 and will continue through summer of 19. The total cost is $14.6 million and the developers are paying for $12.3 million. Next, we're gonna move into projects and design. And these are projects that will start design in the upcoming fiscal year. The 99th Avenue and Olive Avenue Trailhead. This has actually been in our books for quite some time. The existing land has some challenges with being an, an old landfill. So we have done some in initial investigation and we chose to pursue an EPA grant. We applied for the grant in December and are waiting to hear if we've been approved. If we are approved, we will do soil and water testing, which will take approximately six months to make a better decision about if this is a location to build a trailhead and appropriate to be in the city system. If it is deemed not to be appropriate, we will look for another location. If it is appropriate, we've budgeted $2 million. We would be able to get through design this year and then construction would follow the year after. I'm gonna next talk about some neighborhood <coughs> parks. Sometimes when a neighborhood park is built, and we receive public input, we decide that we need to look back later in time. There's new people in the neighborhood and there's new amenities out there that they would like. So Country Meadows Park is one of those parks that we are going to be hiring a consultant and going to the public this winter to see how is it functioning for the neighborhood, are there anything that they would like to change or see different. So we will meet with them this year and then next year we will have the funding for improvements. Carla? <clears throat> yeah, and that Country Meadows Park, what are they supposed to put in there? It is going to depend on the input from the neighborhood. We are not going to direct what those amenities are. We will meet with the residents nearby and we will talk about different types of amenities that are offered in other places and see what the community is looking for. Would there be any chance of getting a, a one acre, probably of a half acre, uh, doggy park in there? I'm sure it will be under consideration when we meet with the neighbors. And it depends on what the consensus is. So we will keep that in mind as we move forward. Okay, thank you. We are going to be going through a similar community involvement process with the Sonora Mountain Ranch Park improvements, as that has also been open for quite some time, and the neighborhoods have changed. Different mm -hmm. people move in, and they have different idea of what they want to see at their neighborhood park. So we will be doing both of those at the same time with the same consultant to save money, just meeting with different neighborhoods because every neighborhood has unique ideas of what works for them. Any questions about that? Okay, I have one. So That's cool. um, uh, is there a consideration of, of making a trail from Sonoran Mountain Ranch at any place, maybe from the park, but at any place over to community park number three? 
I don't know if community service is here, but we, we did, um, we are talking to the flood control district about that trail connectivity. I think there's some land issues that we've got to um, address before we do that, but we're, we're pursuing that with the flood control district as we develop community park three as far as designs goes. Okay, so since that side is, is on the east side, that's not really the land that we are taking down, right? So we would have to talk to county? Um, it's, it's county. That, that entire, I, I believe most of that is flood control district property um, behind the New River Dam. So what we have to do is just look at it as far as implications because you've got the flood pool that's at the bottom there yeah. um, that takes on the initial capacity of, of any type of runoff that goes through that area. So we have to look at how can we cross that uh, as well as other um, land issues associated with it. So we might need to consider looking at that. Yes. Council so member. I don't remember who specifically I had this conversation with because we've had it several times that there's not much likelihood at all of being able to get to across that desert by vehicle but that ultimately we'd have trails connecting from that community to the park. So is that? I think we have it envisioned in the yeah. ultimate configuration. If it happens in the initial phase or the second phase, I think that's what we're not clear as to which phase it's going to happen. And part of that is discussions with the flood control district because what, as soon as we add amenities, what are their requirements for us to add park rangers and other people mm -hmm. to have their eyes right. on those areas? So the larger the area, how much are they expecting to, us to be out there? So it's, and I, again, I don't, it, we've had several different right. conversations. I, I don't think the expectation was necessarily having it in the first phase, but being prepared at that point in time to have that conversation and let the residents of that community know what's coming. Because we, I'm sure that question's gonna come up. We will keep over it on the radar as we develop further phases of the park, which you'll be seeing later. And I, I don't know if there's other expectation, but I certainly didn't have an expectation of it being for vehicles at all. Correct. It's a beautiful desert. It is. <laughs> Thank you. The next neighborhood park we're going to talk about is the Meadows Neighborhood Park. This is being constructed by the developer. They will be responsible for the design and construction of the park. The amenities will be similar to most of our neighborhood parks, but will be guided by a public meeting and meeting with, an, with the school district as they have a site adjacent to this for an elementary school. The land is going to be dedicated by the developer and at the next council meeting, we are bringing forward the agreements with the developer for reimbursement for this facility. The total cost for the de design and construction is $4.4 .4 million. Yes, council member Edwards. Thank you, Mayor. So when do we expect this to go out to um, design and everything? My understanding from the Meadows is that they have a buyer for these parcels. So the plats are, have, are coming to council, the agreement's coming to council. As soon as it is turned over to the developer, then we will be sitting down with them to work on the design. They are diligently pursuing it. It's required per the zoning stipulations, so they will roll it right into design. They're ready, they've already started to look at some concepts and talk about what's needed to facilitate the public and the school involvement. And that was going to be my question is, are we we're going to have school involvement and, and, and the public involvement? Because you know, as, as the community is growing over there, the need for that amenity is, is greater than ever right now. Correct. We have that as part of the agreement, the requirements for the public involvement. And we will be at the monthly coordination meetings the same as if we were handling the design and construction. We are an active participant. Okay, thank you. The next project Andy referred to previously was the Pinnacle Peak Road from 91st to Lake Pleasant Parkway. And the developer is responsible for building the south half of the roadway. We as the city had an interest in providing a roadway that was two lanes in each direction with a raised landscape median, and that roadway is currently in the county. So we worked with the county to come up with an agreement where they will participate in funding the improvements on the north half. The developer will build it, we will reimburse, and then when it is all said and done, it will be annexed into the city of Peoria. The section from 91st to 95th is being constructed by Marikay this summer as their development is well underway. The section from 95th to 99th will be with the developer that will be developing the park. So we don't have any strict schedule yet. We'll be working with them in the upcoming months. Council Member Edwards. <laughs> Sorry, thank you, Mayor. Uh, do we have any uh, word on 
Will there be a signal at 95th and Pinnacle? At this time, we do not have a signal being installed there. We don't show that the, it is required. We are putting in conduit for a future signal if, in fact, it is required. My suggestion is we're widening this road. The, the traffic going in and out of that school is difficult now. It's going to be impossible once we add these additional homes and the traffic. So I'd recommend that we look at putting a signal at that intersection. Okay. Since we are looking it at the design, we can easily look at that as part of the design process. So we will work towards that. All right, thank you. Landscape enhancements. These are three separate CIP projects. I'm going to have to look at my notes so I can tell you the exact location of them. 67th Avenue is from Olive to Redfield Road. 75th Avenue is from Grand to Thunderbird. And 91st is from Mountain View to Grand. These are areas where the city maintains the landscaping along the right of way. They're older parts of our city. Now we have the, exist, the newer subdivisions and businesses maintaining back in the old day that was under our jurisdiction. So historically we have kept up with maintenance but we have not made a capital investment to replace trees and shrubs and decompose granite in these areas and it shows. So we are committed this fiscal year to doing the design and construction in different phases so you'll see those coming on as the year progresses. Thank you for doing that. You're welcome. <laughs> Joe Max Road from Loop 303 to Vistancia Boulevard. We are currently doing a study to look at the alignment for this section of roadway. It involves coordinating with a large APS power corridor. This project is being proposed because ADOT has a companion project to construct the Joe Max TI and to build additional travel lanes on the Loop 303 from Happy Valley to Lake Pleasant Parkway. We are timing our project to open the same time as theirs. The study will complete, be completed this winter and then design and right-of-way acquisition will follow and construction is in fiscal year 2020 to align with their project. The total cost for this is $4.7 million. Next we have the Pyramid Peak Water Treatment Plant Expansion. This is still under design. It could have gone either way. I could have put on the construction projects. We have been working with the expansion of the facility that is located in Phoenix. It's a joint partnership owned by Glendale and Peoria. This project increases our capacity from 11 million gallons to day, per day to 24 million gallons per day. Once again, we did the math. That equates to 50,000 rooftops. We are not saying this is being targeted for rooftops. We're hoping some industries will come in and this would be additional water that would be available for their use. Construction is expected to begin in the spring of 19 for this part of the project and it will be complete in fiscal year 21. The cost is $53.4 million. And that is just our share of the cost? That is just our share. Checking. Thank you. Next, we're going to go into new projects. The new projects that we put together come from our discussions with you at the retreats and study sessions over the last year. We are focused on livability and place making with what limited funds that we have available for new projects. First is the pedestrian and shade initiative. This has actually been in the works for longer than one year. We are going to hire a consultant and we are going to look at areas of high pedestrian activity such as near schools, our transit routes, and commercial shopping centers. Once we identify those heat sources of pedestrian activity, we will look at the shade for each of those areas. Each one will be its own unique shade experience. It may be shade sales like we have in P83, or it may be tree-lined streets like we have in Trilogy. The proposed budget for, that we have for right now is $650,000. <coughs> that. <laughs> I'm it's pausing for you to talk. Obviously not very much money for that. Um, but it's just, it, is this in a companion to our shade master plan that we're looking at? In this our is part of the shade master plan. The first thing we have to look at the areas that it makes sense to provide the shade. And while in concept it makes sense to provide shade everywhere in the city, when we're doing implementation, we want to focus on the areas where we have high pedestrian activity first so that our money goes to the right places. Yeah, absolutely. But it will build on shade principles as we grow for the future. So we're, we're doing, 
Is this money for the master plan or the, is this money this for This fiscal shade? year is for the master plan for pedestrian and shade. That's the 250,000. Next year is 400,000 towards the beginning of installing those shade components. If or, or if the master plan shows we need a different amount of money, it would be that. Then we would look further as to what it takes to implement the whole program. This is just the start of the program since it's brand new. Placeholder. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. That's right. One of the, I think, the scope of that master plan is to help us operationalize this master plan. We, we do have some fiscal realities we have to work in, but it is a commitment that we've heard loud and clear. And so you're exactly right. This is just the first steps. Great. Thank you. Next, we have our placemaking initiative. We spoke in depth about this at the last retreat with council in March. This is creating public spaces that build a sense of community and connect people to one another. We see this being done in many ways, some of it being with special events, some of it being with an increased presence of art, adding seating and shade for people and a sense of community. So every spot will be different. We have highlighted some of the ideas that we have for Old Town. And this is just a starting point. We are also looking at opportunities in the P83 area and the Happy Valley Corridor. If you approve it in the budget, we will begin design this summer and implementation, implementation will follow. We are putting it over the next two years just because we think it'll take a while to do the right implementation. And, and again, just to add on to that, as we said in the workshop, we've allocated $500,000 to each of those specific areas, the Old Town, P83, and our Happy Valley Corridor. Thank you. Inclusive playground for Rio Vista Park. This project will be funded in fiscal year 20. We are looking at doing play spaces for all abilities, regardless of what your mobility challenges are. It includes replacing the existing playground equipment at Rio Vista and looking at the surface treatments to make sure they're ADA compliant. We have shown some representations of what's been done in other areas. We are not sure what our implementation will look like. Right now, we are looking at an inclusive playground also for the new North Community Park. So we will be learning more in this next upcoming year. And then we would eventually like to see the same thing at Pioneer Park. The total for this project is $1.2 million. Adina, this is just a question. Um, a lot of this in the, what's there now, <laughs> still looks usable. <coughs> I understand I'm wanting to update it. What happens to, the, do we donate it or? Do it, use there it is else? quite a bit of wear and tear. If you <coughs> go to the playgrounds at our community parks, they are well used. So there is there is life cycles of playground equipment. So I believe this is just on a regular cycle for replacement. That's my guess. Okay, I guess I'm just thinking that somewhere someone could use this. It doesn't look like it's falling down. I'm talking, I'm sure the plastic on top is probably. These are just ideas for what we could right. build there. Well, no, I, I mean on the old stuff. I just think I'd like to look at a, a really good recycle other than getting money for the steel. We'll, look at, the, that we'll look at the disposition of. Yeah, I don't know what that would be or what that would look like, but it just looks like it could be used, maybe a pocket park or something. So I appreciate that, you're, that you've got this plan for Rio Vista. I did look to see if there was any plan for any other parks, um, including community park number three, and that's like an obvious place where we should plan. That is how we are looking at it for community park three. We just had an RFP out on the street that had people submit ideas for what it could look like, and we will be evaluating those proposals to see how far our money goes and what kind of systems are out there. Okay, and so another thought that I had is you know, varying sizes. We've got smaller parks, such as, such as the, the Park at the Meadows that's coming in. Can any aspect of these kind of adaptive playgrounds be in smaller parks? We wrote that into the agreement with the Meadows Park that they need to look at inclusive and bring the experience to everybody. Oh, aren't you smart? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So we're keeping it in mind as we move forward. The Northern Community Park, this is phase two. This was previously in our CIP, but we had only funded the design portion. This year we are funding an actual construction portion that should provide construction of an additional 35 acres. We anticipate it would include additional lighted fields, walking trails, but it will be in 
once again involve community input after we open the first phase of the park. So this is really good news. Yes, <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> Councilmember Binsbacher. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, okay, so this is actually phase two. I think I'm losing my breath. Uh, so fiscal year 21. What's happening? Okay, clarify. So that'll, right. Say so that again. In May, in May of 20, approximately, we will open the first phase of the park. Okay. So in fiscal year 21, once that park is open, we will be talking to users of the park and residents to say, okay, what did we miss? What do we need more of? And that will start the design process in fiscal year 21. Okay. So then we'll go through the final design and then the construction will follow in 22. Okay, that is great news. That's fantastic news. We think so Yay. too. It's wonderful. Thank you so much for finding a way yes. to bring that forward. It's really great news. The next two projects that we have also focus on how we take care of our community. Our community services department does a great job of maintaining, but just like our backyards, maintaining usually just means trimming the grass, cutting the trees, and keeping your systems working. Every now and again, we need to actually reinvest the capital to make these places look better and new, just like you do in your own backyard. This program for the neighborhood parks will replace actual lost trees and shrubs where you just see the emitter sitting there lonely. We'll be bringing in new DG to refresh the DG, and some of our irrigation systems will really need to be replaced in their entirety so that we're not just chasing leaks. We're expected to begin improvements in spring of 2019, and each year we're planning on looking at two neighborhood parks. Councilmember Edwards. Thank you, Mayor. It's not, it's not a question about these, but you're talking about each year you'll look at additional parks. So do we have like a five-year budgeted plan um, X amount of dollars every year f going towards the parks? Right now we only have budget for the next two years, okay. but we'll be hoping to expand that program. Okay. I think it's important to look at that because as we have the aging parks, you know, we, we want to stay on top of them. And, and it's important, obviously, park number three is highly anticipated and I'm excited that that's moving forward, but we've got to make sure that we stay focused on our existing parks as Community well, so. Services has done a great job of putting together an inventory, so they have a list of already figured out of what parks need to go in what order. Okay. It's just, we'll be, every year we come back to you with the CIP pro budget, so we will be trying to fund those in the outer years. I, I, like, like I said, Mayor, I'd just like to see maybe a little bit broader, rather than just two years, maybe a five-year plan, just so that we start putting some money aside to make sure that our existing parks are, are taken care of. Yeah, Mayor, uh, Council Member Edwards, um, if you recall at the workshop on the 16th, um, we locked in two years. Yeah. Our intent is to go 10 years on this, so absolutely okay. to your point, uh, we'll be pursuing that. Perfect. Thank you so much. I think it's it's great progress, though. Um, moving forward, instead of just maintaining it, actually looking for, for ways to make it better. It's Correct. Big, it's great. Thank you. The companion project to this is our retention base and refresh program. So this is the same elements that we would be doing at our parks. We will also be doing at our basins. Those basins sometimes are used by neighborhoods for play, for recreation, and they are very visible from the streets as we drive by. Mm -hmm. So this is a similar program, also funded for two years, and we will keep that program going as well until we get everything up to date, and then we can stay on top of it. The next project is the Skunk Creek Multi-Use Path. In January of this year, we received federal funding for this project. This takes the trail from 73rd and Skunk Creek and brings it to P83 in the sports complex on the north side of the river. This is especially important knowing that we have hotels and we have apartments coming to 75th and Paradise. Mm -hmm. So this gives people an opportunity to get connected by pedestrian and biking to our whole community. The federal funds are in place for fiscal year 22. The city funding will be required for design and for some participation in the construction. The LED streetlight conversion is the next step of our Amoresco project. This will be converting the arterial and collector streetlights to LED throughout the city. We have estimated the annual electricity savings at $250,000, so in just over eight years we should be able to pay for the project, which is estimated at $2 million, and this will be starting in the next fiscal year. I'd just like to add on to this project. Um, we'll be 
bringing forward in the next month or so a um, request to start an audit for this that uh, Amoresco, who's the one that's doing our current sustainability projects, um, is currently got a contract with Phoenix um, to do the LED conversions and there's a lot of people that are utilizing that contract because the, the LED fixtures um, from the manufacturer are 30% cheaper than you can get um, without that contract. So that's the reason that we're we're, we're going forward with this project and proposing that right now. Um, so what we'd like to do is, is start that audit early so that we can be ready to go with the actual conversion, hopefully early in the fiscal year of next year. Great. The next project is the Bell Road Peoria Auto District. This project has been in the works for approximately two years and was started with the Economic Development Department working with our 18 auto dealers that are housed along our only section of Bell Road from the Loop 101 to the Western City limits. We talked to them about what some of their threats and concerns are, and they're in competition with some of those auto dealers that are going up on the, the Loop 303 and the 101. They felt if we could bring in an enhanced landscape median similar to P83, it would benefit the area and provide some connectivity to their different dealerships. They also agreed to rename their area as the Peoria Auto District. They thought bringing the name Peoria into the name of the district was helpful so that everybody would know where they are. Hmm. So this project will install signage and the landscape median. The design was already funded, that is nearing completion, and this fiscal year we're asking you to fund the construction. So where does, what's the span of this? This goes from the Loop 101 goes west to our western boundary around 92nd Avenue. Oh, okay. And it's just median, it's no, nothing on the... Um... Well, we started to look at things on the exterior of the right-of-way, mm -hmm. and there are overhead power lines, and you would think that's the only bad part, but there's underhead ut underground utilities everywhere. So mm -hmm. luckily in the median, we have a corridor where there are no utilities, so it should make construction easier. And this is the rendering of what it would look like. It would have palm trees and then they would have a lower plantings below. They want to do some LED lighting that would be changeable so that as there's different events going on, if it's breast cancer awareness, if it's domestic violence, they wouldn't be able to change the colors, red, white, and blue for the holidays. So the LED That's lighting right. gives them that opportunity to change it up. And we are doing this for them, is that correct? We're doing it as a part of a city project. This is a city project. They bring a substantial sales tax revenue yeah. to the city. So this Peoria Auto District? Peoria Auto is District. This is just is that an initial a, concept of what okay, it would look like. But would that be a one-time sign at the beginning? Or? There will be a sign coming on both sides. So one sign when you're getting off the Loop 101 and one sign when you're entering from Sun City. Okay, that looks nice. Councilmember Patena. Thank you, Mayor. So, Adina, about 18 months ago, this this uh, auto dealership thing was a hot topic, and then it just sort of died, it seems like, for a year or so. Is this back now? Is it being resurrected, and, and are the dealerships still in favor of this? We have been meeting with them over the entire time. So, initially, we had concepts that showed spanning the roadway that they were very excited about, but those utility conflicts, when we got into design, really made that not a possibility. So it's just taken time to get through that phase and then regroup with the, with the auto district. We have met with them and they are all in favor of this project. Yeah, to give um, just a little bit of background on this, when we originally um, estimated this project, it was going to be very similar to our P83 project and we had, I, I believe, nine or ten million dollars allocated towards mm -hmm. um, construction funding for this project. But as Adina stated, when we looked at it and we saw that it was infeasible behind the curb adjacent to the, the car dealerships to put anything in there because of the underground utilities as well as overhead utilities, um, we looked at um, how we could go forward with some kind of improvements in this area because it's obviously an important area for us um, to improve the area for uh, new car sales tax. Um, so that's what we looked at as far as the median's concerned. And, and so your construction dollars are less, but we still think we're gonna get a big impact with these improvements. So I have one more question. Um, are we going to lose any traffic capacity? No, we have in? done a study to look at the left turn lanes and if some need to be extended, we will do limited landscaping in the area where it would need to be extended in the future. Okay. So we, we have the traffic study to go with it to make sure that we aren't impeding future progress. Thank you. Next, we're going to move into our community works program. 
As you know, these are opportunities throughout the city that come up during the year, smaller projects that normally wouldn't be funded through the capital program as an individual project. Some of these are signing and striping and minor, minor traffic control changes, trail connections, entry monuments, local drainage, it runs the gamut, tree replacement, shade canopies. <clears throat> Examples of recently completed projects, the West Green Park Playground replacement, 95th Avenue and Las Palmeritas Drive Access Gate, wall painting in various locations, and street lights in various locations. The proposed fiscal year 19 community works program is very similar to past years. I just want to highlight a couple of items. For our neighborhood traffic mitigation program, the NTMP program, we have added a little bit of additional funding. We've had a lot of requests on that topic lately, and we've been spending our money consistently the last two years. So it went from 35000 to 50000 We also added in the green bike lanes. That was brought up recently at our council retreat. And there was an interest in exploring that in our community as we have seen some of the other communities also rolling that out. So what we will be looking at will be in partnership with our biking community to see what ideas they have and what's going on in other places. So we're starting that with 45,000 for next year. For entry monuments, the one that is funded for this year is going to be installed at Thunderbird and 68th Avenue. And based on our retreat, the one for next year will be at 67th Avenue and Peoria, replacing the old entry monument. I have a question about the neighborhood traffic mitigation program. Yes. You said we're increasing that from 30 to 50? 35 to 50. So I, I thought at some point that we would actually grow out of needing that, that program because we would have done all the traffic mitigation in the older neighborhoods and we wouldn't build any newer neighborhoods that needed traffic mitigation as time went on. So why are we increasing this? Why do we need to increase it? In some of the older areas, there are some neighborhoods that have never gone after those type of improvements. And as new people move in, they come from areas where they may have had speed humps. And so then they bring that idea and they're allowed to petition <coughs> and go after that. So we are seeing a lot of it in older neighborhoods. In newer neighborhoods, we would like to think that we have figured out exactly how to design a road so people don't speed, but sometimes it is not the case. And we have to actually wait and see where we are having issues and then address it after the fact. But much of it is still in the older parts of our city. Okay, I hope that we are looking for ways to build new neighborhoods or not allow neighborhoods to be built in ways that cause problems for the people who buy those homes. I mean, I know it's cheaper for developers to build neighborhoods in a certain way, but it's, it's just not always the best way for our residents to right. live. So we have to really In the ideal watch world, that. we would just like it if everybody would drive safely in our neighborhoods. <laughs> yeah, we have to do things to try to help them with that. Yes, we do. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have any other questions or comments? Because that is all that I have prepared for this evening. Yes, Councilmember Patena. So I think whoever dreamed up community works program was a genius because it, <laughs> it was me. <laughs> because I, all of us, all of the county, I've used it twice already, and I, it, it's a, a great way of getting projects done very quickly. So my question to staff is, is $550,000 enough? I think that it is enough because part of it is we're fitting this in with all of the other projects that we have going on and there is only so much that we can get done to meet everybody's expectations. So I think the amount of money makes sense for the projects we are able to get completed in a fiscal year. And yeah, if something I, comes <clears throat> up, we can always come to you on a council agenda and ask for a specific project to be funded throughout the year. I'd add on that you know our experience over the last 10 years with the Community Works Program is that um, we use it all of that $500,000, especially in the streets fund, but we've never um, been at a point where we've had to come back for additional funds. It, it's a great uh, program to enhance neighborhoods as well as be able to respond to citizens when they've got a legitimate complaint on a street improvement to do something quickly. Um, but we've never had to go past that 500,000, come back to, to council for, for additional funds. Yes, Carlo. Yeah, I haven't heard you mention, and it's been 20 years, and I want to know if it'll get done in my lifetime. The park is supposed to be on Olive and 99. Do you know anything about that? I'll just forget about it. It's off the books. 
the, the issue with the 99th and Olive Park that uh, I think we discussed this last um, year as part of the capital presentation. Um, the reason that we've got the Meadows Park as a refresh project in the area is because the 99th and Olive Park, which was targeted eight or 10 years ago to be improved as a neighborhood park, um, is, was, um, is cited on or was um, planned to be on an unregulated landfill. When we went out there and we did some geotechnical testing um, a year ago, we found that the entire area has solid waste underneath that, that, that land, um, anywhere from 18 to 20 feet deep. So to put a significant investment of 15 to $20 million in there was, was not reasonable, and we recommended moving those funds to other areas and helping improving some of the existing parks like the Meadows Park, and that's why you saw it, you see So that was a landfill? Event. Yes. You know, the whole area of Peoria was a landfill. I got more landfills in my district yeah. And you can hear in your head. Yeah, the, 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 and, and the, the difficulty with that is to s spend significant dollars on improvements when that area has the um, probability and, and likelihood to, s to settle pretty significantly. Um, it didn't make sense for us to put funding in, in those areas. So just saying they, they probably will never develop it. I don't believe so. Now, you could come in and remediate that. Um, somebody could come in. We don't own the property, um, but the property owner could come in and remediate it, but it would cost significant uh, money to go and excavate that entire area and uh, backfill it with clean fill. So what you're saying, all of the 99th, that community park is over with. Yeah, that's correct at this time. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Well, thank you for this presentation. I, I think the, the, um, the whole project, I mean, all of the, um, the CIP actually touches our citizens and improves our city in a way that um, not only amenitizes things for families in Peoria, but also increases property values and um, beautifies our city. I mean, it is really a, a great program. Thank you so much for putting all of these projects together and finding ways to fund them and, and um, making sure that everything that we do here touches our citizens. Okay. Yes, Council Member Hunt. I think you guys are magicians. <laughs> and not only are you magicians, but you really listen. You really listen to us. And we've stated that our main council goal is to make life really nice for our citizens and safe and uh, accommodating and pleasurable, a really great place to live. And the amenities that you're adding, um, they're just amazing. And I think you're magic because of the way you have um, <laughs> uh, found the dollars to do it and the way you're moving them forward. And I hope Bridget recovers soon from her surprise that her project is moving forward so quickly. And uh, it's just wonderful. And thank you so much for all your work. And, and also, I know it's other directors and other departments that have fed into um, what you've done. You haven't dreamed it up on your own. But that is correct. Just the, just the amount of legwork that our city has done on these projects is just amazing and just thank you very, very much. Thank you, we appreciate the comments and, and we also appreciate um, when we get um, council input on projects over the, the, the fiscal year so that we can plan for what we know is the interest of the council in the future capital program. It makes it easier for us when you tell us what you need for your district. I wanna say one more thing. I just want to add one more thing. I guess the other thing that really impressed me was how, how evenly distributed the projects are throughout the city. Um, I mean, there may be something that isn't being done. I, I wouldn't know what that is, but uh, just to look over, you haven't neglected any part of the city at all. And you've also gone from huge projects to very small projects that impact maybe a small segment of society, but you've still done them. I, I just, I'm very, very pleased. Councilmember Binsbacher. Thank you, Mayor. I wanted to say um, also that thank you, thank you to everyone for all of the work that goes into something like this. And 
uh, just when I think, you know, there's no way you could outdo the year before, you come forward with a presentation like this, it's just unbelievable. Um, but it's balanced, and not only does it address the existing and enhancing the existing and maintaining certain standards for our citizens, but you're effectively addressing the growth. Um, and I think that's so important. And you are listening. It, it shows. And I just, I have to hold up my book. I came here with all these markers on these pages to ask these questions, and there's nothing to ask because literally, you covered it in this presentation. It's, it, it runs so smoothly, it's hard to believe that it's real. Um, and it is, I came here anticipating a lot of questions and you guys are 10 steps ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Edwards. Thank you, Mayor. That's pretty much what I was gonna say too. I had tabs uh, marked throughout the book and you guys addressed every single point. But what I wanna also add is the the dedication and hard work that you guys do listening to us, but also listening to the constituents when you're out at the community meetings and hearing the good, bad, and ugly, and taking their feedback and then kind of incorporating it into what we uh, are asking for. And you always seem to hit the mark every single time. So for all of the directors, but not only you guys, but your staff, the hard work, that countless hours that your staff is out at public meetings and meeting with us out on site, it doesn't go unnoticed. And I just want to thank you uh, from my perspective. Anything else? Yes, a couple, couple more. <laughs> more things? Tonight. There's more? <laughs> yes. Um, as a housekeeping item, um, yesterday we had some conversation about the circulator um, for Northern Peoria. And one of the options I think that um, Mr. Kent was able to, um, or one of the items that Mr. Kent brought up was the timing of when we can get the circulator um, operational is based on the, the uh, RTPA's scheduling of the routes. Um, one item was that potentially if we gave them the go-ahead in April this year, then we would have the ability to start the routes next April versus waiting to October of this year, it would take till the following October. So what I'd be interested in, in knowing is, is this council interested in the April go-ahead versus an October go-ahead. Um, we have the ability to do that, but we need council consensus to do that. Uh, council, does everyone want a circulator in our city? April. <laughs> absolutely, consensus, okay. absolutely. Okay, so yes. we will go ahead and um, direct Stuart to do, do all he needs to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave the room, go call with Yep, call right now. <laughs> yes, do you need the tie? Send your email. <laughs> <laughs> he needs his tie, he needs his tie back. Yeah, exactly. Um, so thank you for that. That was one item we just wanted to follow up with before we uh, completed these discussions. Wanted to real quick just go over the formal adoption process for you. Um, we will, on May 1st, we'll be bringing forward both the capital improvement plan adoption as well as the tentative budget. That's an important date that kind of sets our, sets our appropriation for the year. So we want to make sure we have everything in our budget that we need to have in our budget by that time. Um, we also will be uh, bringing forward, as we always do, and as required by statute, um, we'll have a public hearing on, on the, in the truth in taxation um, and the final budget, as well as the budget adoption and another pa public hearing for the tax levy on May 15th. And then on June 5th, we expect to bring forward the solid waste rate adoption, which we have to do a separate adoption for that, as well as the property tax adoption. So those kind of the dates that you'll be hearing from us um, over the next couple of months. So, and then I would just ask if there's any other final uh, budget items that council has or any other direction for, for staff at this point and otherwise this is all we have. Uh, everything that I had has been addressed. Um, council, I think I heard from all of you that you felt the same way. So thank you for a great budget process and great CIP process. I mean, it was really remarkable. Thank you. And as always, if anything does come up, please um, reach out to the budget office, to uh, the executive staff, and we'll be happy to work with you on that. Okay. Final adoption, final adoption is on um, the 15th, May 15th. Oh. Tentative is on May 1st. And then May 15th will be the final budget adoption. So tentative is typically we would not want to make we would not want to have any changes between the tentative and the final. 
And just to reiterate, there will be no tax increases. That is no correct. property tax, no sales tax increase. Correct. But we still have all of these dates to make sure everyone knows that. <laughs> That's Arizona's process for you. Yes. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Tyne, anything else? No, uh, Mayor and Council, that is all we have. Again, uh, we understand that this budget is a dynamic document, so there will be <laughs> items that continue to come up and materialize, uh, and we want to make sure that we will be adaptive and flexible. But this is so helpful to go through this process to really identify the different trade-offs, our capacity, your interests, and we think we have wonderful marching orders from this. So thank you very much for your time as we spent Thank you. On this. And with that, we are adjourned.